So I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, the uh, Frontiers of Geophysics lecture. As most of you know, the Frontiers of Geophysics lecture is actually a relatively new thing at the meeting. Um, it's been going on just for the past few years, in fact. And the goal of this lecture is uh, to invite somebody to speak on a topic that is of broad interest to the AGU membership. Um, traditionally, over the past few years, we have had somebody speak on an area of research that's been going on within our community with the continued growing size of the meeting. Um, this is becoming increasingly a challenge to find somebody to speak on one topic that is of interest across uh, the membership. And so this year we actually have taken a slightly different tack. And one of the things that's absolutely essential to us as a community is our ability to access and to interact with geospatially referenced data sets of all kinds and on all kinds of spatial and temporal scales also, whether it's for the Earth or for other bodies in our solar system. And that's a core part of what we do. And our speaker this evening has made um, enormous contributions to this uh, through uh, what we see as Google Earth and as Google Maps. Um, but he's going to speak on a broader um, aspect of, of that today. And so it's my great pleasure this evening to introduce Michael Jones, who's the Chief Technology Advocate at Google, formerly the Chief Technical Officer for Google Earth, uh, for Google Maps, Earth and Local. And Michael has a very impressive career, as you can imagine. Um, he started in North Carolina. He graduated from North Carolina State uh, with a bachelor's degree in computer science and uh, went from there to a variety of positions, all of which involved, to summarize them, all of which involved uh, at some level innovation and uh, leadership in software development, software um, managing software teams, leading uh, new businesses or new endeavors. In the early 1990s, he moved to uh, California and took up a position with Silicon Graphics, uh, leading or as part of the uh, team that developed the um, Iris developer uh, software. And he went on to uh, build that up to be a big advocate for that, went on then to be the chief uh, executive officer for intrinsic graphics, intrinsic graphics, then the chief technical officer for intrinsic graphics, um, then to Keyhole, um, and from there to uh, Google Earth, Google Maps, and then now as the chief technology advocate at Google. And so he has an impressive uh, background, many uh, patents to his name, um, and a variety, the innovation has spanned a variety of different things. Um, one of his first uh, endeavors was actually in developing an automated trucking system for delivering uh, food to about 2,000 Hardee's restaurants. So you can go from there to Google Maps. <laughs> and so it's my great pleasure to introduce Michael. Uh, he will speak this evening on the spread of scientific uh, knowledge and he'll speak for about 40 minutes or so and then he'll be happy to take questions. So, Michael. Thank you very much. Okay. So I, I've never heard that much about my past before. And I didn't, I didn't write that either. So I have to correct one thing. I didn't graduate from North Carolina State University. I only went there. I went there for... Uh, it doesn't say that on here. Yeah. I went, I, went, I went there for a semester. And it was boring, so I quit. So uh, one of the things you'll uh, discover is that uh, I believe in activism. And when you're in the wrong place, you should move on. So, uh, but I, I came in second in the Southeastern ACM programming tournament. Had to check out of a hospital with 102 people to do that, and went to work for the Dean of Computer Science. So it wasn't like failing. It's in the same status as Larry and Sergey. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk to you tonight about something that's very important to me. It's called the spread of scientific knowledge, something I've never had the opportunity to speak about before. And I made this uh, topic up because it's something I've been reading about, and thinking about for almost a year. Is is basically how does important information get communicated? I work at Google where. Our, our reason for existence is communication 
between humans of knowledge that people find important. Now, if you are sick and you're looking for a doctor, the doctor's phone number is important. If you're looking for a hospital about the baby's about to come, the map is important. D different things are important at different times. But we have many products, some Google, Google search, we're looking for documents, Google book search, we're looking at books, and of course maps and earth, which are close to my heart. But they're all about connecting people with information. They're all, uh, not maybe, maybe not specifically driven by, but they're consonant with uh, American President Thomas Jefferson's idea that the actual, the shining light that is knowledge and understanding would actually be the, the safety net for a whole country. People could make informed choices. Letting people make choices is nothing. Letting people make informed choices is everything. So Google is about informed choices for all of humanity. And in, in some of those choices, some of that information, it's scientific information. Not all of it, but some of it. Obviously that's of uh, high pertinence to you, and it's obviously of high pertinence to myself and my hundreds of colleagues that uh, help build Google Math and Maps and Google Earth. So first I'm going to talk about a kind of uh, notion of evolution. Uh, people have changed over the years, and, and a, a side effect of that, uh, the, the, the sign of intelligence, oops, we have to run away, don't read all this, whoa, it's exciting, but it, I didn't do it. Okay, let's just, let's just go back here, see if we can have a good time here. Okay, now, if something weird happens, I'll have to uh, uh, seize control. Now, intelligence, oh, that's really exciting. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a little bit of this real-time command and control here. Okay. May not be fancy, but I can make this work. And as a testament to the power of science, I can make it work even though my lens was taken out of my eye three days ago, four days ago. So uh, we'll just have to uh, be really proud of what doctors can do these days. Okay? And that'll be that. They put a new one in, so it's not so bad. Um, okay, stay, stay. Okay, so uh, this is kind of a, a pictorial representation of the evolution of man. Not man as, stop, 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 okay. Not man as uh, homo sapiens as an animal. Man is a tool user and a tool maker. There we have, it's kind of obviously it's a little silly, but the idea here is that some of these tools are tools of a personal defense or uh, you know, food, food gathering. Some of these are tools of uh, sort of a second level, sort of a, a, like a, a agriculture, which the thing about uh, growing a field of hay is that you can't eat hay, right? Growing a field of rice is you can only eat so much rice. And so whenever you have this kind of agriculture where people grow things they can't live on, then obviously they're part of a society that functions in a, in a manner of trade. There's a interdependence in those kinds of societies. And the tools of those societies allow specialization, allow economic growth and development, but they also make ever-increased your dependence on somebody. You know? Like if you had billions of barrels of oil, you'd feel pretty good, but if you had to drink it, you'd feel pretty bad. Right? So, so, so the interdependence is very important. So now, some of these uh, tools, Jane, Jane Bellow Goodall saw the first chimpanzee she saw him take a try to get the ants out of the anthill, and he couldn't reach inside, so he went and got a, a twig off the top of a tree, pulled the leaves off, pulled the branches off, and then stuck it down in the hole and pulled it out. He held, left it in there and pulled it out and got the ants and ate the ants off it, right? So that, that, that tool building is a sign of intelligence. Well, the tools we build have a applicability, in many cases, to scientific communication. And I thought about that, and some of them are, and I thought about this broader than scientific communication, but communication in general. Some of them are like, interpersonal tools or facilitators. Some are uh, personal facilitation. Uh, if you have an adding machine or calculator, you probably add numbers for yourself, right? You don't add numbers for strangers or for, you know, it's a, it's a personal thing. But other tools like a telephone, you don't usually talk to yourself, it talks to other people. And there are other tools like a television where you, know, you could stand in front of a camera all you want to, but it's only valuable if it's broadcast to other people. You depend on other people to be valuable. So there are some tools that built into them is, is an expectation of how you're going to share that information. I'm going to talk about those three things. Now, in the first case, in the personal style, I'm going to talk about uh, what things that got us to Roger Bacon. So Roger Bacon, not Francis Bacon, you know, and not uh, Chicken McNuggets or some kind of pseudo-Bacon, but Roger Bacon was a, a uh, actually not all that successful as a scientist. But he, he wrote some very, uh, uh, very good things. And I have advice for you, too, since much of academic publishing is, a, is a, your success about what you write. His first book was called Opus Maius. Okay? 
Uh, that, that means it's, it's his major work. Don't, don't call your first book your major work, right? It's very career limiting. Um, but but his, his theme in that, it was very important. He had watched the, um, basically the rise of universities, and he had watched what had become in, in the 1200s, 13th century, the, basically the, the uh, what we might think of pejoratively as the calcification of the education system. In the 1960s, rebel in you know 1214 or whatever, and uh, what he didn't like was and one of the comments says it pretty clearly. He said, you know, this we study we study Aristotle, we study algebra, we study all these things, but all these knots are tied and untied. All these clouds have gathered and dispersed before. You know, I know what my father knew. I knew what my grandfather knew. I graduated with a unit of knowledge, but it hasn't changed in generations. What's the point of this? Which I like that because it does sound like 1960s, and it sounds like 2008, and I think it's a perpetual plea of children and teenage students in college. And of course, he was older in this picture. At least it's an older picture. Um, but one of the comments he made, and I won't read it here in Latin, but basically it says, "Without experience, we can know nothing sufficiently." He thought of that as his rebel rally and cry, which means you, you, you can't just read about things and be an expert in them. You certainly can't just read about them and hear other people tell you about them and then deduce important insights about science and about nature with this sort of secondhand living. And so that was, that was, his, that was his story. And in fact, that, that description is, is, is uh, actually engraved above a doorway at Oxford. If you go to Oxford, you can see that. Now, Kind of go beyond the personal uh, to the more sort of interpersonal, which is where I get more interested interested in this topic. And it's very important. It's, if you think about science as a as a subject, imagine there was a, a course or degree in the the psychology of science or the sociology of science, the history of science as a history and not as science. Can you imagine that? Most of you probably didn't study that course. It's like all that stuff was invented the day before you went to school. And when you graduated, you have 100% of mankind's knowledge, and you just figure that's a, con a continuity that happens to every new arriving class, every matriculating class. Well, the truth is, it doesn't work that way. So what, it, what happened was the Greeks and the Egyptians, and there's a point to this, trust me, it involves Google Earth and Google Maps and you in a very important way involving the next president. But in any case, um, the Greeks and Egyptians had uh, worked their way through uh, a number of uh, scientific or educational med medical advances. You know, they did brain surgery and a variety of things using stone tools. Um, not all of those things were successful, but uh, they, they had developed a large body of knowledge. It's very famously stored in the Library of Alexandria. It's very, very, very famously uh, great knowledge of people like Imhotep, the great architect of the, the pharaohs who built pyramids and other things like Luxor. That knowledge, for whatever reason, dissipated with the Egyptian culture. The Greek knowledge, in large measure, as viewed from the Western society, say from Europe, Western Europe, disappeared with the, with the sacking of Rome. The Visigoths didn't bring back, you know, calculus tables, so to speak, right? They, they, just, they just burned everything and, like, take all the women and left town. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't do what a visiting scholar would do, okay? <laughs> all right? And I was just, it, 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 very, well, it might, depends on the scholar, but, uh, uh, I was just in Rome with the, the mayor of Rome and uh, people from the from the government there and cabinet ministers and uh, you know it's just fascinating to watch how Romans, modern Romans, modern Italians in Rome, think of themselves as Roman. I mean, it was, it was very clear to me that the mayor of Rome and his cabinet, the cabinet ministers in the national cabinet, were felt like they were a lot more aligned with uh, Julius Caesar than with me. You know, I, no, it was it was very interesting. They had a great heritage they were very proud of. And over Thanksgiving, I had a chance to uh, study other people's heritage and, and that they're proud of. And in particular, what I found out was that the Syrians, the Moors, both in northern Africa and in Spain at the time, Jews, and, and in particular, in almost all cases, almost all Arab-speaking Arabic speaking people did not lose that culture. They cherished that culture, that culture of scientific knowledge. And they shared that with each other. They developed that. And they did something that no one had ever done before. The reason that the Greek knowledge got lost when Greek kind of faded, Greece faded, partially because of the Magna Greca thing overextended Greece, but, but a big part of the re reason all these things stated, faded was because the knowledge was confined to basically priests and acolytes of that knowledge. 
Okay, so you can imagine if somebody were to accidentally stumble into university microfilms and see a giant Indiana Jones type warehouse full of PhD theses. That would be amazing. They're, probably nobody ever goes there, nobody reads those things, but if somebody did go there, they would find all this research knowledge. That, the equivalent of that in those times was, was non-existent. If you wanted to know how to do something, you had to go ask a master craftsman, a master doctor or whatever, how to do it. If they liked you and you studied long enough, you might, they might tell you some of their secrets. They were very, I would say they were not very forthcoming with their insights. And uh, that's uh, something I'm pretty shocked that uh, we haven't overcome either. We're going to talk about that later on too. So expect to be chided for that. Now, what happened, what happened though, was quite interesting, is that these Arabic-speaking peoples had a, an odd take on all of this. And particularly, the Caliph of Baghdad, there was this sort of golden era in Baghdad where they thought, you know, there's all this knowledge out there. We have these people in caravans. They find out great things when they travel. Let's go and get the best, smartest minds and get them all here. And we'll build a place where they can all come and study and write. Writing, right? Writing. So they had people from Persian area. They had people uh, from uh, uh, Jordan, they had people from Syria, they had uh, Christian people from Syria, they had people from all around getting all their best, best knowledge and understanding. And, and what they did was, it was really the first time they ever did, anybody did this, they, they actually wrote it down and then gave people copies. Okay? And nobody had done that before. They, they'd always said, well, I'm, I'm, you know, like, I can solve cubic equations. And if you'll pay me 50 drachmas, I'll solve your equation. But I won't tell you how I did it. Okay? That's kind of how the world was before that. You can come to my doctor's office, my surgery, and I'll help you if you pay enough. But I won't tell you what I did. And so that, that the first time somebody thought, I'll, I'll figure something out, and then I'll tell people, really happened in, in, in these Arabic-speaking countries. And, and the, the great uh, name that we have from that is Mr. Uh, Al-Khwarizmi, who's a man in the, in the stamp. It's a Russian stamp, if, if you notice the Russian there. And it says, and it, and it celebrates a great a Persian man who, who did the following thing. Uh, he's credited for a lot of things. Almost all of them he did. Okay? He, he's a really good guy. There's only a few of these really good guys. I mean, there's, there's Imhotep, who's like, you know, godlike almost in his, in his knowledge. There are a few others. Akrazami, he's one of those people. So he personally wrote on many topics. He was a polymath guy, self educated, but he went to this caliphate area and learned a lot. He, for example, he had ideas like algebra. That caught on, you know? <laughs> it's named for him. Remember when you were when in elementary school and talked about uh, grouping, you know, with parentheses, you know, associativity, commutativity, distributivity, those things? He, he, like, thought of those things as principles. He thought of the ways of solving quadratic equations from all the possible cases you could come up with, A, B, and C being either 0 or 1, uh, and, and in general cases, and reduce those to, to a rigorous step. His idea for that was something called an algorithm, right? So, yeah, you know, these the ideas like, uh, Arabic numerals, right? The idea of a, a base 10 decimal place system, right? These, these things caught on, right? And the bizarre thing is we think of them as like, I don't know, who, who thought of algebra? Oh, so, somebody in England, I bet. You know, like, well, no, you know? There's somebody in England, in, you know, with, with a name like algebra, you know? It's, it's not from England, you know? It's not from France, it's not from Poland, you know? So uh, what happened was, these, uh, these traders would travel around and they would actually talk to the smart people in town and they would tell them what they had learned in other places. So I, I have imagined how that worked. I have no, there's no history of how that worked. I can just imagine this caravan of camels coming in and some guy saying, oh, here's that guy with the guy with the purple tent. He can solve third degree equations as long as the roots are not quadratic thirds. You know, it would be, it'd be so fabulous, you know, to see that. And we didn't get to see that. But what we can learn is that the spreading of scientific knowledge by people on camels gave us the basis of all of the math and science that we have right now. That's how tenuous the spread of science is. Okay? The result of that knowledge enabled something quite important and quite different. And that was the rise of something called the university. Two months ago, I spent a week at the uh, first university in the world. It's the University of Bologna in Italy. And they're quite proud of being the first university, the first multi-curriculum, basically doctorate place in the planet Earth. And they have a long history of that. They were big on uh, 
medicine there. They had the Theology University in Paris. People from Paris ended up going and starting Oxford. People from Oxford went off to Cambridge. What happened was basically it got out of hand. It took about 40, 50 years. Everybody had a university of this or that. They got rich people to leave money behind to create a university. There was no particular curriculum. And so what happened was that there was a kind of a reformation where people decided to make a standard curriculum. There were the three critical topics and the five critical topics, and you had to know all these things. And some of them you could learn in the classroom. Some you had to learn by examination, by, by experience out in the field. Uh, people studied uh, geology, for example, is one of these topics. They studied that, at least in the United Kingdom, or in England at the time. Basically, rich people, the only ones kids could go to school. So what they would do when they got to be 18 or 20 is they would go on this thing called the Grand Tour. It was felt that if you took a tutor with you, he could teach you geography as you toured around the Europe. You go to the Alps, go to the, you know, go all around, go to the Camargue in France and so forth. So this idea of uh, experiential teaching harkens back to the Greeks. It's incredibly inefficient because you have one guy, one drunken teenager, and his rich keepers going around Europe, you know, in a caravan. It must have been a great thing to do, but I'm sure it was not as effective as a classroom of people hearing like a physics lecture or a chemistry lecture. So uh, what happened though, in, in, the, in the rise of the universities was uh, basically a, a, uh, a period, this, this is important, trust me, it's really important, because all these things, I learned everything from the past, everything I know, you know thousands, 8,000 books or something, and everything's in the features in the past. So people got tired of universities because they became stagnant. Universities became powerful, and the church said, this thing is scary, I'm gonna crush it. Then they said, no, actually, even better, I'll take over the university, you know, and I'll be the church and the university will kind of merge and I'll kind of control things. And then the truth was, came to, came to be believed it was kind of a, the truth was a thing, like, like it was like the periodic table of the elements. And when you got it all filled out, you were done. It, it, was, it was like you could learn the truth of math or the truth of science and then it would be figured out and then you could just teach that forever and you wouldn't need any new books or anything. And there were people who weren't satisfied with that. And, and what, what, they, what they did was, they started something uh, called the Societies. Uh, and, and the Royal Society was the first one. There were some others, other academies, and they were basically the, uh, the you know, Middle Age or Renaissance version of a chat room. Okay? N not to dismiss the Royal Society, I was, I was just there recently, but, but basically, you know, what you do is, and they, the Royal Society first met at this guy's house, then they met at a bar. So imagine you go to the bar with like Newton, well, seriously, all these guys, they're all hanging out at the bar, they're drinking, they're talking about things, saying, what have you done? Well, I found the glass, in the glass like this, it does that. He put the little, the, you know, the prism, the light reflects like this. They're actually sitting around talking in a very collegial way. People that didn't go to the same college. People that were visiting scientists from other colleges. It caught on so well that they basically, um, there were other academies created around the world. And the academy is actually the thing that I'm so excited about. I think that there's an opportunity for us to do that same thing now. You're here, which is much like that, but it's like for a week. It's not like every week, every month, forever. Um, one of the things that happened that was really clever in the Royal Society, that was a great marketing breakthrough. They had marketing back then. Uh, the Royal Society was the first one by only a few years, but they invited, they sent honorary memberships to the leading scientists of Europe. So they actually sent something to Leibniz and said, well, you're automatically an FRS, you know, you're a fellow of the Royal Society because of your great genius and your work in science. And they did that for maybe a, a, a bunch of people. They invited them to be members and that gave uh, an audience for the Royal Society's proceedings and it gave international visitor, you know, we, we, we make you a voluntary member, uh, honorary member, so to speak, and then you gotta come and talk to us and that makes us have more people come. Where that ended up was the Royal Society meeting place in London. It's a big auditorium, about this size, a little bit smaller maybe, but two tiers. But off on the side, there's a box. There's a, like a witness box, in a little, uh, little pinned off area. And that's where the press used to sit. And what they would do is, when there, when there was a press, you know, after Milton and then Areopagitica, what they would do is, people would come to watch the Royal Society meetings, and there'd be some guy here, some scientist, some explorer, and he'd pull out of his bag, like a big squid, or a, you know, a pygmy head, or whatever it was. No one had ever seen that before. No one in, in, in England, or maybe in, in the West. So, so they would then write down the story and rush off to their editors. So the, the scientific discovery was, was contemporaneous, was you know, second by second commingled with 
essentially the public's awareness of these scientific advances. You know, the public. I recently read uh, the Principia Mathematica again, and uh, uh, that was first serialized, you know, almost like one of these novels in a magazine. In the, in the proceedings of the Royal Society, there were, there were people from the public that would like, you know, wander in and sit there and listen to Newton talking about how things worked. Okay, it's, it's very much like a chat room, and very little like a structured oratory. And that, that's very important. That's very important because it, 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 what it does is it does the same thing that Al-Khwarizmi did. It, it, it takes your best d data, maybe with faulty interpretation, and puts it in the hands of other like-minded people to compete on understanding what you've discovered and may not quite fully understand yet. And it's the understanding that's important. Okay, that's something that we really focus on at Google, for example, um, and at the phone company. They had this phone book. Imagine all the numbers were in the phone book, but they were in a random order. Okay? Well, you know, it would be like having nothing at all. And so it's not just getting all the data together, it's organizing all the data that makes it accessible and useful. That's what's valuable. And that, that, this, this notion of, of properly prepared people listening to you, sharing, that's important. Okay, now. Here we go. Joseph Glanville wrote that, that he wrote something called an apology or defense of uh, the Royal Society. I don't know why he needed defending. Maybe they had a big party there or something. But uh, basically he said there are the three biggest things in humanity for spreading scientific information. It's the printing press. That's good. You know, it worked out pretty well. The compass, which, which I guess he meant you could take the books you printed somewhere else and they could read them. And the Royal Society. Okay? And, and, and the, the thing that's so important about that is that when scientists work alone, well, you know this because you know a lot of insular, irrelevant scientists, but when scientists work alone, they, they deduce things which make sense to them. Those things go untested. When scientists don't publish, when, when publishing is a once per career thing or once per decade thing, you know, in, a, in a real meaningful way in referee journals, the, 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 the sense of no negative results, political correctness, it goes on your permanent record that you have played up in the fourth grade. It's so strong that basically it makes you not be hungry for information or hungry for correction or hungry for insight of others. It makes you be totally defensive, like your life and your mortgage is on the line, that you're the only one that could possibly milk the data you have for a career. And that is not the same thing as, as al Khwarizmi riding around handing out instructions for solving quadratic equations. Okay? It's so different than that that I'm very sad about that, and I actually have plans to do something about that. Now, on the uh, impersonal side, what I mean by impersonal, obviously all these things involve persons, but they involve, they, they, in some cases, they, dis, they dis sort of disaggregate, in a sense, the deliverer of the knowledge and the receiver of the knowledge. So the printing press, you know, I write the book, and you buy the book, and you read it. Well, maybe it's a good book. You learn something, but I don't know you. You can't ask me a question. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, it's, it's a very cold, a very, you know, standoffish thing. Photography was a huge way to share data. Edward Murraybridge and others shared data that everyone had seen horses run, but they never actually saw them. You know, 6,000 years of seeing them and never understanding what it means to trot. Because your eyes don't work that way. That's certainly true for infrared photography. It's true for a lot of things. So radio was a wasteland of education. You know, you think about what could have been done with radio to reach out to uh, people who didn't have schools. Nothing was done. If you look at television, there's, there's uh, Sesame Street. I, I, I met Joan Gans Cooley last year, and she invented Sesame Street because she said it's a wasteland of television. We should colonize it for children. Uh, that's great. And now we have the computer. The computer is the one I care about. If I forget the others. The, 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 the computer, it's not the computers are good. Computers is just a thing, you know, it's like a shovel. What's, what's important is that computers can be connected. Right? You, don't, you can't even imagine a computer that's not connected, right? It doesn't sound like it's a real computer. I have a great computer. Can I see it? Oh, no, it's just sitting there in the cloud. You know, like, it doesn't matter if it's not connected. Computers can be connected. They build a network, taking all humans to deliver information and knowledge and understanding, to create a two-way discussion, to do things that were never before possible, and never, never, like absolutely never before possible. Basically, with, through computers and networks, you can do for the entire planet on a global scale what people did at the bar when they talked to Newton about. What do those rings mean when you put the two glass plates together? Well, I think it means it's dirty. Well, no, I think it's something important. You know, you know, that, that, that kind of discussion can happen globally. Now, let's think about that. 
Let me give you a sense of this. In the last 10 years, okay, 1.4 billion people went online. Okay, like they weren't doing something 10 years ago that they are doing now, and there's 1.4 billion of those people. That's a big number. You'd think if that happened in the last 10 years, we'd be thinking about that. You know, like say people, also, like say 1.4 billion people started wearing like funny hats. You know, you'd say, hey, have you seen all those people with funny hats? Right? You know, it would be, it would be on your mind. But actually, it's so universal that it's completely almost undetectable. So, so part of my job is to try to measure things that are irrelevant and undetectable. So, 1.4 billion people. Now, every day we have 1.53 billion Google searches. And there are probably hundreds of thousands of other kinds of searches. So, there are, there are, uh, <laughs> There, there are a lot of searches going on. Now, th those are, those are, you know, on the average, say, a, a search per person. Now, some people are search hogs. They might search ten times, you know. Other people might go a whole day without searching. Yeah, how many people here have gone a day without searching for something this week? And one. I'm serious. I'm, I'm, I'm not joking. It's two, three. I see maybe on the order of like ten hands in a pretty big room. Ten years ago, zero people on the planet did that. Right now. 95, 98 percent of people in this room do that. that that's, a, that's really different. You know, it's even bigger than funny hats, right? Okay. Now, for me, the really biggest thing is just 400 million people have downloaded Google Earth for the first time. I like that. Now, the reason I like that is because 6,000 years, mankind avoided all knowledge of geography. You know, they wouldn't go to class, they wouldn't pay attention, they wouldn't color in the map in the seventh grade. They don't know what the Pacific Ocean is, you know? They just don't care. There are people in this room, of course, maybe you care more than some people, but uh, uh, in general, it hasn't been a subject of interest. And now, it's a, like a mania. It's like the golden tulip or the, the black tulip. You know, everybody has to see their house, has to see grandma's house, has to fly around and see where news stories are. I think it's great. I think it's great. I, 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 I try not to be too uh, bizarrely philosophical about this, but imagine if, if uh, you were going somewhere, like, you know, to Hawaii in a boat, but it was a closed-in bubble. You couldn't get out of the bubble. It's going to take a two or three-week trip. You're going to take four people with you in this little bubble. You're all in there real close. You know, if they like have bad breath, they'll smell it for you know three weeks. You'd be careful who you picked on that thing. I'd go on that trip. Okay, you're, you're on a planet with six billion people, and you, you can't change that. And its atmosphere is very thin. It's very fragile. The uh, forces of nature that we think of as evolutionary forces are. Natural forces, I believe, uh, I mean, they're dead. So it's important how we think about our planet and how, uh, how connected we are to those things. Now, about 250 million of these internet users, these broadband people, they're on social networks, you know, like MySpace and LinkedIn and Facebook. And, but other things too, like the Pearl Harbor Survivors chat room. You know, where were you? Oh, I was here. You know, that's a big deal. It's, it's not some trivial thing. It's, it's a big deal because it's not about computers. It's about how important it was to survive Pearl Harbor. Exactly. Kind of it's very important. Okay, 183 billion emails, instant messages daily. It's important. Now, I don't know how many emails you send. Now, a lot of those maybe are for, you know, Viagra or something, but a lot of those are real. You know, the funding proposal is being rejected by the NSF. <laughs> okay, we have 10 billion YouTube videos streamed every month, just in the U.S. Now, the, the thing about that, I mean, I can't measure everybody else's videos, but, you know, people didn't used to watch extemporaneous videos. You know, the closest thing to that was when your grandparents want to show you home movies, and everybody would like to say, oh, I'm really tired, i got to go, you know, right? It's 10 billion. So, so the appetite for information is enormous. It's truly enormous, and it's changing. And, and what that means is the following. It means that products like Google Earth that combine the freedom of searching with the freedom of the, with the global totality of the planet allow you to see any information that's on, on the world, you know, maybe not quite at the mantle yet, not the, you know, but, but uh, in, in great detail. You know, you go see the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace, you can come to the pictures, you see the videos, um, you go to the Old Globe Theater, you can see where people sat to understand where where people would look in stage directions. You see all these circles here? Each of these circles, well, I couldn't show it to you well there. I'll show you in a minute. If you saw the prisoner that's where tried to break out from, if he had Google Earth, he could have gotten out in the first episode. <laughs> okay, these, these uh, rings, these, these are books about Dublin. Books that mention Dublin locations. So the first ring of book results is the outer ring, and as you get closer and closer, the concentric rings 
Oh, it, it, it went away. I'm so sorry. So, this this experience. Actually, I, I'll go back. I I shouldn't I shouldn't teach you this because it's important. So I, I won't make you watch the same part again. Though, how's that? Okay, we'll start here now. The point of our product is is like is people get confused by this. Now here we have here we have the young Fryak, we have the Matterhorn. Here we have Mount Everest. Okay, now our job is done when we show Mount Everest there because all those markers and dots came from other people who don't work at Google. They might have come from people who went on hiking trips, so to speak. They might have come from National Geographic Society. They might have come from Sherpas celebrating Tenzing Norgay's work. But they didn't come from Google. They came from the people of the planet who used the planet as a place to talk about the events that matter to them. Right? Use a web browser. It doesn't matter whether it's from Netscape, or whether it's from Microsoft, or whether it's from Google, or wherever it's from. What matters is that the content in the web page comes from somebody that's sharing information with you. It comes from an author. Right? The web browser does the bold and italics part. The content comes from the researcher, the scientist, the doctor. Right? So this is, this is our Earth browser. And what we're doing is we're letting people understand their world and share information about it by providing spatial context for all the world's information. Now that, you know, it's your part. If you're, you know, if you built the Taj Mahal for Mumtaz, you, you, you're the one who has to tell me about that. You know, that's your part. Now, unfortunately, scientists haven't really done a very good job of this. We have seen, I mean, this week you'll see lots of scientists doing this, but, but what I mean is it tends to be like an after-the-fact decoration. You know, it's like, this is the Niagara Falls. If you've never been to Niagara Falls, but you've heard about it, now you know what it looks like, what it really is like, how high the falls are. You have a kind of a personal experience. So, what, what happens, and, and this, this is important, is that, is that there are a lot of things you can know, like you could read a book about, uh, say, when you're 10 years old, 12 years old, you read a book about holding hands is fun. But when you hold somebody's hand, you know, romantically, it's, it's, it's not the way you thought it would be when you read the book. Right? A lot of things you don't know, a lot of emotional things you don't know. And unfortunately, the way the humans understand is this, this dual process theory is that the emotional part is a critical enabler to the logical understanding of what's going on. You have to care about it to sort of play with it a little bit, and then the logic of it sinks in. This is actually in San Francisco in sunnier times. And uh, in fact, we are right here. Make sure nobody is confused by that. We're, we're uh, right uh, there. That's us. In fact, if you look up, the big eyes right there, um, at the Mark Moscone Center, and then of course the sort of trademark uh, Trans America Pyramid. So, so the, the idea, the, this is the this this is the equivalent for us of the blank web page in a web browser. It's the equivalent of static on the radio. Okay, it, it, this isn't this isn't the the product we went went to build. This is the empty graph paper we built so that you can plot your equation. Right? This, this is, for example, there's some archaeologists who, who use Google Earth to map out where their dig sites are. And then neighboring archaeologists that didn't know about each other say, oh, I didn't know you were digging on this river. I'm upstream 12 miles, but I found some, some of this and that. Let, let's talk. You know? that, that's, that's like the academies, at least when they used to meet in the, in the bar. Now, there's another part to this that's very important. And I, I, I want to talk about this, too. This is very important. So, There are things that you can't know until you go to the place that you're talking about. You can't know how big the Grand Canyon is, really, until you go to the Grand Canyon. It's big, but it's like it's not. It's more than big. It's like, wow, this is like the Earth almost cut in half. You know, it, it, the, the feeling of it is something you have to go and see. Travel changes us. Everybody knows that. T. S. Eliot certainly knew that. Virtual travel, amazingly enough, is able to bring enough of the power of place, the genus loci to actually transform people the way that travel could do. And I, I have an example of that I'll share with you. This is uh, Condoleezza Rice on the left. I, I just spent some time with her a couple months ago. And we were talking about you know, Google and Google Earth and things we could do. And she's looking for a job, you know. And uh, <laughs> um, uh, on, the, on the right, you know, I showed her some stuff. This is why I showed her. I said, I said, you see that? That's Google Earth, you know? And she said, yeah, I've heard of Google Earth, you know? Earth, Google, yeah, I've heard. I said, no, no. See all the red flames? She said, yeah. I said, those are totally destroyed villages in Sudan, in Darfur. Totally destroyed. Like 1,000 homes, 2,000 homes, totally destroyed. All the people killed or driven off, all the animals seized, all the houses burned. All the yellow ones, and it goes all the, all the way to the horizon. You can't see it on the screen, but it goes all the way to the horizon. The yellow ones are half destroyed. I said, now, 
you know, all the, the refugees, they weren't all killed. The refugees in refugee camps. He said, yeah, I know. I said, well, this is a picture in the background here. You can't see it because it's blocked with that pop-up. But here's a picture of the refugee camp. You can see the tents. You can see the big water bladders. You can see people playing, kids playing. I said, you know, the Red Cross and the, and the United Nations were interviewing the people, the refugees coming in, and the kids running around making too much noise. And so what they did was they uh, gave the kids crayons and paper and said, go draw, you know, while we talk to your mom and dad. And uh, we had this video of the, what, the, what the kids were drawing. They, they drew pictures of people being raped, uh, being macheted, uh, houses on fire, villages being machine gun strafed. It's like children. I said, so you can go through camp by camp and house by house and see what the children from that house drew. Okay. I said, in fact, a lot of times when the people were killed, it was actually the women that were killed, and the husbands, uh, boy, uh, or whatever, were, were, you know, basically, like in this one, one case, the brother, you know, the mother was gathering all the kids together, trying to get them out, and the husband was trying to get them out, and the, the, she didn't get away in time, and the dungeon we came, they said, we're going to rape you. And she said, I, I, won't, I won't sleep with you even if you kill me. And they killed her right there. Her brother was there. And uh, he, he told the story, and, and it was corroborated, so it's on the house where she was killed. So it's, Thousands of, you know, ten, hundreds of thousands of burned out houses, thousands of stories, these chilling pictures, and people can fly around on their own and view that. It's put together by the National Holocaust Museum using Google Earth, only to show the context. You know, so Constantine Rice said, wow, I had no idea. And, you know, I was, actually, she was there, and so was uh, David Miliband, the Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom. So I'm thinking, well, I got the two people here who are the two most powerful people on the entire planet that solve this kind of problem, and he had no idea. I'm thinking, how do I be diplomatic? You know, what, what do I say that's sweet? You know, like, wow, yeah, that's a big surprise, you know. And so, uh, um, so, so I, I didn't say that. So I, I was thinking really, really hard. And I was thinking, I said, well, no, it, you know, she must know all the facts and figures, right? I mean, she's like super, super smart. I don't know if you've met her, but she's like scary smart. Uh, I work with smart people, but she's like really scary smart. Um, she, she has, you know, like the CIA and like all kinds of people that tell her things. So. If something happens, she knows it. You know, she has like a red phone, red red cell phone or something, right? She's like, she's connected, right? Um, she has every resource of the country, you know, people to add things up and build a cell spreadsheet, maybe or whatever it is. You know, she she she's not like out in the alley wondering what's happening in Sudan. You know, she's in the White House wondering what's going on in Sudan. Um, she's incredibly intelligent and perceptive. And so I, I thought, you know, all the things I could think of that would make me think she's, you know, you know, too busy getting her hair done or something didn't apply. The truth is. She had never seen the information in context. She, she had gotten Excel spreadsheets. She'd gotten pie charts about relative casualties this month over last month or this quarter last year. Right? She got the kind of stuff you get you know, from a stock market report as opposed to working at a company that's your company. Right? It, was, it, was, it was cold and, and it was data. It was, and it was understanding, but not, not emotional engagement. I mean, I'm sure she did a good job. I'm sure she's done a lot of great things. She said, but she just, she, because the thing is, she was like totally entranced by this, and so was David Miliband. And what she said was, she said, you know, we can use this in the State Department. We can use this to show our staffers where things are. We can use this for briefings. We can use it for the press and the president. So she was immediately trying to think of all things she could do to use something that's been there for seven years. You know, three years before Google, four years at Google. Okay, so. Uh, and, 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 and she was great. I had no problem. But the point is that there are more people like that who have data to see, have decisions to make, have, have information who's, who, where context could bring it to life. People in this room, people you try to get funding from, your family that wonders why you go off to you know Zimbabwe every year. You know, like the, 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 you could tell them, see, I'm exploring this. I'm discovering this this subduction zone and with my big periscope on. I mean, that, that, there's. They don't know what you're talking. They know the words. But they don't know the. They don't know. They've been kissed. You know. They just read about it. So. Uh, so. My last comment about Google Earth probably is, where is Google Earth most popular? We have a product at Google that's really fabulous that people don't know about too much. It's called Google Trends. You can go and see like, who searches for Nike tennis shoes, and what country are they in? Say, so, oh, people in Zimbabwe search for Nike all the time. You know, you, you can learn locations and search trends. It turns out that the most popular per capita, you know, m most searches per person in the country places to search for things like Google Earth and Google Maps are in countries where political and information freedoms are either new or minimized. People are hungry to know about the world around them. They're hungry to make decisions and act on that. And they don't all have a good opportunity. Now, 
I'm gonna, I didn't want to make a slide about this because I didn't want it on, it's on, but I don't have to write it down anywhere. So, uh, something important is happening. So every four years, we, 48 years, we have a new president, and a new president-elect uh, uh, has policies, and a lot of times their policies are different between the elect, uh, election process and the actual presidency process. But uh, the new uh, president, many of you probably, uh, you know, get money from uh, government funding, school funding, that kind of thing. Uh, President-elect Obama has uh, made a, er, indicated a real strong preference to uh, significantly increase funding for basic research in the United States, significantly, maybe more than double. And uh, he's reached out to a lot of people that he thinks of as, as technical advisors, and we, we told him how we think it should be done. And there's something we suggested that, that you might not like, and I won't tell you what it is, so at least I was honest, even if you didn't like me. Um, I told you I really expect, expected uh, Akrazami for figuring out something and then telling everybody about it. And that we saw this flourishing of information through the university system. Within 25 years, all the educated people, basically there were a whole elite class of educated people that had read all the works of Aristotle. 25 years after the, they were books totally lost to Western Europe. Just 25 years within the creation of the university system. So what's happened is that the free form information in universities has become stagnated. Uh, there are so many people in so few journals comparatively that there are either very narrow niche journals that people don't read or there are very major journals that take seven years to get published and your data is irrelevant. And there's also a funding process where if you gather data, if you publish your data, you've given away your gold mine because if you don't publish it but you make you know, interesting, insightful, but cursory analysis of it and say, I need more money next year to further anal analyze this data, that's become the that's become the business of most uh, academic researchers, is to uh, do a little and make it last as long as possible. And I, I'm not saying the, the academic researchers are bad, I'm saying that the funding environment has encouraged a kind of uh, spiral of uh, information death. And so our proposal is that new funding should be increased, funding should be increased to new levels, and new levels should come with a, our advice is a stipend, uh, sort of a stipulation that uh, you only get the money if you publish your results as you, as you gather them. You know, so if you go out there and get some rocks, you got to publish those. Like, if you get data, if you, so here's the deal. Here's what happens. You, it's kind of scary, I know, but here's the idea. You, you, you build a network, a sensor network. You go out and take samples or pictures. You, you, you do research. You check where glaciers are. You look at placements of tectonic plates. Whatever you do, you publish the data on your website, on the wherever. You don't have to involve Google. You just, you, you, you make it so that other researchers can find it. Like you bring your notebook to the bar and sit down with Newton on a global basis, right? Then you can compete on a secondary game for how smart you are at interpreting the data, right? But then all the other people on the planet can interpret it as well. It's very important because we're, uh, we're facing some challenging times. It's not all hyperbole and rhetoric that uh, we have some challenging economic and environmental problems all connected with how we uh, act as humanity. And they're gonna be, they're, they're either, either it's all just a bad dream and it's gonna go away or it's real and it's going to take sacrifices that are so brutal in some dimension that people won't want to do them. And the backbone to do them is going to come from scientists who can actually say definitively, we've measured all that mankind can measure, we know all that we can know, and we just, you know, like your leg's got to come off. You know, that, that, that kind of insight. It's not time to screw around for you milking that for 20 years to then say, oh, I figured it out, because it was too late then. So the, the, the tone of increased funding should come with increased visibility. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of pressure being exerted to encourage that, and, and I, I hope you'll embrace that as in fight that. I think you'll find that your students and students of other researchers will really find fruit in the tree that you had overlooked. I know in my, my parents uh, lived on a farm, and, and my father grew up on a farm in the Depression, and you know, they would, people would pick cotton, and then other people who are more desperate would go back and find all the cotton that was overlooked. Right? There's, there's always like another, another bite in that apple if you're hungry enough. And it's a time when we can't afford to overlook all the data, all the information that's in the data, all the knowledge and all the guidance that science can bring us. And, and it could come from uh, any, any quarter. So, so the, the transparency and communication features of the Internet are, and Google Earth is one, and FTP of your data is another one, are an extraordinary change. And what I see is I see people applying for grants. I go to the NEA and NSF and talk to them. People apply for grants to put their data on a computer to put their data on Google Earth, to make a website. That's ridiculous. You don't apply for a grant to like take a taxi to the airport. You know what I mean? Because that, that's part, part of your business. You, you don't apply for a grant to use a calculator. You know what I mean? 
if, if things are really productive, you, you just would use them intrinsically. You wouldn't try to pay somebody to help you do them. So anyway, it's your business, not mine, but I'm, a, I'm on the same planet with you, and, and I'd like it all to work. And, and I think we may need to kind of push people out of their local optimum if we're going to try to seek a global optimum in terms of uh, data stewardship and knowledge sharing among the educated people of the planet. And that basically concludes my remarks. Thank you. So we'll uh, take some questions here, if there are any questions for Michael. Oh, there's a man with a question <laughs> and a good voice. Yes, sir. That's a very fair question, you know, uh, I, and, and I, I think I have an answer that we, we also, okay, I'll, I'll be, I will repeat the question and I'll answer it. So the question was, he said, that, that's a good point about openness in, in science, but what about openness in government? You know, if you think about uh, lack of communication in government, it dwarfs any, any lack of communication in science, and, and furthermore, the, the moment arm is even worse because uh, people die. People starve, things go bad, you know, maybe stock markets might get affected or, or homes might get lost. And so. Uh, um, that's the sort of thing, right? And, and then, you know, do we have a, do we as a company, uh, Google, have a company or other companies like Google have a, just kind of stand up with righteous indignation and say, no more naughtiness and expose your data, you know, uh, to government. And, and so that, 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 the answer is, is pretty much, in my mind, I can't speak for Larry and Sergey, but, uh, in my mind, I, I think we're, we're, we have the same role as scientists in the following way. The privilege of being paid to discover creates a debt to mankind to share the results. That's just the way it is. You, you know, other people are like watching the baseball game. You're like uncovering a, you know, King Tut's tomb. When you when you find his hat, you can't like put it in your garage. You got to tell people about it, right? You know what I'm saying it's it, it's not it's cheating. It's just cheating to figure out like you know it's all from SS theorem and not tell anybody, right? You you, you have to share the results. And I think uh, uh, companies, likewise, especially Google in the information business. We, we work so hard to be transparent and clear about what we do and don't do and what we, how things get ranked and all this kind of stuff. So it's, it's, it is important. Now, now, for example, speaking to uh, uh, Secretary of State, Madam Secretary Rice, um, I, I have to admit I was, I, was, uh, I was very friendly and I wasn't very forceful. But I did uh, exchange. I said I really enjoyed seeing, seeing you and I enjoyed having you understand the power that's available to you and I will work with your staffers to get this into the State Department. So I, I was uh, complimentary about her sensing that there was a, a further gain to be had, and I didn't uh, offer any reprimand for, you know, where have you been the last eight years? You know, I, I, I admit that. Okay. It wasn't necessarily a reprimand, but truth. Oh, truth. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 uh, part of the reason I have my job is, is, is that uh, I'm pretty fearless when it comes to telling the truth, and uh, I get, you know, I, I have a lot of jobs, but I've always told the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a question. Right here, this gentleman. Yeah. Yes. Hi, I have a question regarding the publishing thing you mentioned in the act, uh, being a big use of uh, Google as well. That's something you haven't mentioned, but right? right. um, I think journals are a good place to publish work, but I also feel that they close the work and uh, it's not really available to people outside of academia. And you see that more with Google as well. Uh, what's your feeling about it? Okay, so the question was about scholarly journals and sharing in that regard, the, the virtue of, of journals, but then the, the fact that they form sort of like a closed information society within the journal space, if you go to the library or whatever. So I, th I think that, that that's an area where uh, the business model and the opportunity haven't caught up. You know, journals are expensive. Uh, the kind of books I buy, the kind of books we all buy, are expensive. The $100 books from Springer Verlag has thousands of dollars in mind every, every year. Because they get published in like 800 unit lots. That's the truth of it. They're not bestsellers in the New York Times. They have a small audience. You, know, you give them a file in tech, and there's a book that costs $800 or whatever from CRC Press. 
th there's a problem with that. I mean, you know, everybody, you know, a lot of people could pay more, you know, ten dollars a book, hundred dollars a book. So there's an opportunity for them to have a bigger audience and a, and a smaller price, and, and we see them struggling to find ways to do that. Now, Springer Verlag, in particular, and, and I in the fields I work in, in math and computer science, are very aggressive in doing like early publishing lines of books. I don't know if in, in, in geophysics particularly, but in, in, in math and science, you know, something might be published in the communications of the ACM in five years, and you can get a kind of a official preprint now. Most professors put preprints of accepted articles on their website now in PDF form. So the truth is, and Google indexes that now, and we also even index the text inside the photos inside the PDFs. So if it's a scanned document, we index that as well. So, so the, the accessibility to other researchers of technical work is actually growing greatly uh, through, through a number of sources, Google Scholar being one and others. So, so I, I think that's actually getting better. I don't understand why there has to be a, I mean, I don't understand why, I can't, I can't think of a reason why you'd say, I've got all the information and I'll slowly dribble it out. I, I find that horrifying. I, I did work once on something I called Herodian Triangles. This is my first published, or would have been my first published math thing. If it hadn't been that it had been solved in like 1850, Okay, but I but that the index of the AMM wasn't searchable. So I I, I tried to find people working the same thing, but they had a different name to it. These are right uh, these are uh, triangles with integer area that don't have right angles, you know, like three, four, five, but not no right angles. So so it, it turns out that there's a system for how to find all those. And so I did all this work, and I did, then I found out that later on that it had been solved ages ago. So I think that that problem really is, is shameful. And and so one of the things that, for example, Google has done is we do deals with companies that have very controlled content, where we still index it, you know, kind of secretly as a friend, and then we don't show you the result, but we tell you, well, that's in volume 17 of the journal on presbyopia. You ought to, you ought to pay $800 to get that journal. But at least you know where it is, right? So we can index it for you. Okay. I think okay. There, was, there was one in the back over here. And then we'll yes, the lady in the gray. Yes. Yes, okay. Okay, so that's a very good question. So, okay, so, so the, 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 the question, the, the, the claim, and I, I agree with you completely, by the way, is that not so much the scientists wouldn't share the data. Oh, actually, I disagree slightly, but it's not so much the scientists wouldn't share the data. They do share the data. It's just that you don't know how to find it. It's not indexed. It's not searchable. It's in weird formats. It's, you, know, it's where, you don't know where it is. It's in different, it's, so, so it's not unified, it's not codified, it's not cohesive and searchable. You know, and that, therefore, it's, it might be hidden in plain sight, basically. Now, that's true. But what, what is also true, and this is the part that bugs me, is that the principal researcher might have data that's public, but he'll not tell you what the columns mean. Okay? I might not tell you that a code 17 over in column 800 means the other data is negated or something, right? That, that's, you think I'm joking, but I'm not. Okay, because Google's the business of getting data from lots of scientists to build Google Sky and all kinds of things, and they don't even know how to interpret their data. Okay, so so it seems like only the PI can decode the secret, you know, of the data. In the future, there'll be like the one of these uh, mystery novels about decoding the secret of Scripps Institute's uh, format or something. And the truth is, it's uh, it's <laughs> not not that you know it, not not that John Arcade did something wrong. It's just that you know each PI has their own way of doing things and so forth. So so. Uh, I will say from my personal experience, I can't speak for Google, but in my experience, uh, trying to make up a grand unified file format is a complete disaster. You know, waiting for some giant national index of such and such data is a, is a disaster. I mean, it's a great idea, and like Inspire is a great idea in Europe, and it's only, you know, even 10 years, and soon it will be, you know, closer to being a real plan or something. It's, 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 these things are terrible. You have to do, act on your own and do things now. People find your website, you know, there's, Hundred, there's many millions of KML files on the web, so people can find data, um, and the idea is to embrace all the data you find, is my advice. Okay? I think there was a couple of questions. In there's some people over there, too. Yep. Their arms are way up. Yep. They're getting tired. They're holding on strong. Okay. Yes, sir.
Yes. At the same time, for example, the, the stealth bomber is based on obtuse Russian research done years ago. Stealth fighter, yep. Which F-117A Nighthawk. But now, after having shared that information, which is from open research, mm -hmm. you would agree that no one would make that, that information of how to build a stealth bomber, which is from the right research, open. So where do you think sharing of information like what exactly the search algorithms for Google are from the mm -hmm. to where do you want to monetize? So there is power in hiding information. There is power in openness of information. Oh, I think there's great power. Okay, okay, so, how do you, great. How do you great. So the question is a very good question. It pierced right to the heart of my thesis, which is I'm telling you to share your data, but we keep all our data secret. You know, something, something like that. And so do a lot of other companies. And, uh, and so, so let me be real clear about that. So, so um, it's kind of one of these two-part answer things. So one part is we're talking about if you have an extra pot of money, and you're going to make that money in difficult times, and you're going to give it to scientists. Anything you should ask for, anything you should say, you know, like only American citizens get it, or only whatever. It's no, you, you give it to all the right people. They're smart, you know, pure, pure uh, hierarchy of uh, capability. But but try to get them to share the data as much as possible. This would be government-funded research with a extra mandate for extra aggressive data sharing with comprehensibility, right? So it, it basically it's not your money; it's the government's money. And that would be the reason for that. Now, uh, Coca-Cola keeps a secret. I mentioned about uh, the formula for Coca-Cola. Uh, the government didn't invent the Coca-Cola and didn't pay them to make Coca-Cola. Right? It's a commercial enterprise. So yeah, I, I, I can't ask Firestone to give out the recipe for Firestone vulcanized rubber or whatever. Um, I'm just saying that I think when we give money, people come to Google, for example, professors and students, to get us to give them money. They say, you have money, give me money, because NSF won't. And we say, well, what are you going to do? And they say, well, I'm going to go collect these butterflies, and I'm going to like hoard them at uh, you know, my university. And I said, well, why, why would we give money to do you know, like, you know, so, so the, all I'm saying is when we give money, we try to give money to things that are going to be smart people that do something for the whole world. We give money to people in Arizona, and they like build a database, and there's Google Sky is available to hundreds of millions of people. You know, it wasn't that it was Google Sky. It could have been Microsoft Sky. The point was that it got out to the world. It wasn't like hidden in a warehouse somewhere. Okay? We talked to people at NASA. They had a... A satellite had gone to Pluto, and then the data came back and right onto tape went to a warehouse because they didn't have any data, any money to put it on online. I thought, well, what's the point of going to Pluto if you can't like look at the data when it comes back? You know, so so that we're just pretty shocked by that. Now, as far as companies like Google with uh, commercial advantages, uh, we do we do keep some data secret. Obviously, we keep you know social security numbers and all kinds of stuff secret. Uh, our search algorithms we keep secret. Um, and I think there's a place in commerce, I believe personally, a very strong place for privacy as well as public things. I think patents are very good. I think a lot of things are good like that. But what we do that's, that's extremely important is we don't focus on maintaining a secret. Something is, is changing, and I didn't mention it before, and I'll take a moment to answer that if I may. There's a, there's a long answer, but I'm not dodging questions. This is a really, really important topic. So it used to be that a good business when you invested in the stock market in 1900 or 1820, was a business that had some permanent strategic advantage, permanent competitive advantage. Like, I'm a warehouse corporation, and I own 80% of Oregon, all the trees. Well, then clearly, you know, you're, you're golden. You, know, you got all these trees, you're going to cut down the trees, you're going to make paper, whatever. You know, it's like, like it was clear that they had some thing. You know, OPEC obviously has oil for a while. Uh, you know, Venezuela has oil. People have, have natural resources. They have a kind of a, a gold mine, so to speak, and that's the logic of that. Companies wish they had a gold mine. Companies in more transitory businesses. Coca-Cola doesn't have a gold mine. I mean, it has the formula for Coca-Cola and the bottling plant. And if you, people stop liking Coke because it tastes too sweet, they'd be out of business, right? So th th they're, they're hoping you won't change your taste, but they don't have any, you know, they haven't got you addicted. You know, they just, it just tastes good. And if you stop tasting good, you stop going there, stop buying. It used to be true that companies could think they had a, sustainable advantage. And a lot of business management books and executive books were about how to build and maintain your core competency, your strategic advantage, your, you know, kind of, kind of build a wall around your country to keep yourself safe. And what's happened is two things. Technological progress has made the fundamental change in the way technology is used during the course of a career and over time, such that it used to be you have one technology change per career, like you work for the police and they might discover fingerprints. You say, well, I'm doing fingerprints now all the time. 
And then 50 years later, they discover, you know, blood type or something. You know, you know, there's one thing per career for each person. You're, you might do a fingerprints, your son might do blood typing, your granddaughter might do DNA or something. You know, one per career. It's not happening anymore. Now it's two or three per career. So the, the, the pace of change is accelerating. And it's just a little bit of reflection will tell you that. That means the half-life of a competitive advantage is shortening precipitously, exactly in proportion to that. The half-life of the value of your PhD knowledge is shortening exactly at that same pace. Okay? So if you know how to use a, you know, ultra spectrophotometer, you don't know how to use a giga spectrophotometer, then you're doomed because by the time you graduate, they'll all be using giga spectrophotometers and working on a peta spectrophotometer. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's, 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 it's a serious issue, actually. So, so I'm not going to tell you there's going to be a singularity where it all goes to zero and the, all our brains explode or something. I'm not saying that. But, but there's, there's a, a, a phenomenal acceleration of the pace of change itself. That is a phenomenal shortening of the like, staying power. Imagine a, an army where everybody had like one bullet. You know, like that. There's, you change the nature of warfare. Okay? There's, a, there's a shortening of the power of companies through some tightly held thing. So I keep a little statistic called the time to irrelevance, TTI. And I, I, I kind of, it's a private thing, I keep that for our competitive companies and former companies. And uh, in the case of IBM, which is a, a majestic company, I have great respect and I worked there for a while. IBM became important early and was important for a very long time in computers. They invented almost everything that was important except virtual memory, which they stole from University of Manchester in England. But everything else they invented, they're like gods. It was unbelievable how smart they were. It's like a, infinite flowing of great things from them. And Bob Evans, their CTO, is somebody I got to know and, and a great, great respect for a mentor. They now are a fabulous, profitable company doing consulting and maintenance. They don't really make computers anymore, for the most part. So, from a, their time to irrelevance as a, as a fountainhead of computing was maybe 50 years, which is great. Coca-Cola is still going strong. Okay, if you look in the, uh, look in a two-year-old or four-year-old computer magazine, like if you ever clean out your garage, look in an old computer magazine, none of those companies are still in business. Like Microsoft's on the back cover, they're still in business. Google wasn't even in business. That, you know, the, 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 the dynamic in the kind of businesses we're in is so fast. Here's the point, that if we keep a secret, if we get a patent, it's irrelevant. But having the patent issues, we don't do that anymore. We, we launched, uh, launched a new version of Google Earth database yesterday. You can go see new things in New York City, other places that weren't there the day before. Okay? We launch new versions of Google Maps every week. We launch new versions of Google Search every week in the sense that the ranking algorithm is always being tweaked a little bit here and there. Things are get better and better and better. Okay? So it's a constant product development for companies like Google and like Amazon and like Yahoo. Okay? Um, it's, it's true for Microsoft in the online division. It's not true in the, uh, the Microsoft Office division. They may constantly be working on Office, billions of dollars a year, but you don't see it until every three years or two years. So that that difference in the internet and in data sharing is creating a phenomenal acceleration that's pretty, pretty much devaluing hard assets, you know, intellectual property assets. Not that, I'm not saying there's no value, it's just that it doesn't have staying power. So our interest in keeping a secret is hugely reduced. Our, in the case of search ranking, the only reason we keep secrets, really, is because uh, every time people figure out how we do ranking of things, uh, all these scammers, the guys that send Viagra emails, also figure out ways to get ranked at the top of the, you know, Hello Kitty for Christmas list with Buy Viagra here. You know, so we have to constantly at war with these like losers. Okay, we'll come out of the alley to like put ads on things. So it, that's the reason why we keep secret. I mean, I'm serious. That's that's it. Okay. So yes. I think that was. Let's oh yes. Take a couple over here, and we'll take one more, and then that's it. How about red? Red first, lady. <laughs> Okay, so the question was uh, uh, about non-proprietary things, such as scientific journals or Google Earth or whatever, would they be enhanced if they were non-proprietary? Is that fair? Okay, so, you know, I, we all have our own opinion. You know, actually, I like buying, like, cars that are made by car companies. I like flying in airplanes made by Boeing and Airbus, right? The, the kind of idea of a bunch of professionals working together to make that is pretty good. I don't mind using Firefox, though. That's okay, too, right? They're professionals. They just don't all work at a big company. Uh, at Google, something we do with Google Earth, is that we invest a really big amount of money, like, I can't say how much, but like, really a lot, okay? Like, <laughs> um, I'm trying to, you know, like, uh, 
you know, like, I'm not going to say whether it's more or less than $100 million, but that would be like a good number to think about when you think about how big a number I'm talking about. On buying data, licensing data, okay? Satellites cost like $500 million, and if you want all the data, it's kind of like you want all the milk out of the cow, you got to buy the cow, right? So um, it, it's, it's hard to get data. It's very expensive, okay? We, we, uh, um, we therefore, it's, it's, it's an investment that, for example, WorldWind, which is an open source earth browsing tool, which is fine. People are fine. Patrick Hogan's fine. Um, some of their Polish helpers aren't as fine, but uh, the WorldWind guys are basically fine. They don't have a lot of money to buy data. Right, so they have different kind of data than we have. So, you know, theirs is open source. That's great. They have kind of bad data, free data, but bad data. We have expensive, shiny data, but it's not open source. You know, and there's a trade-off, right? So that's got a value to some people and not to others. It, you, you get to make your choice. About 400 million people seem to prefer the high-quality data of their house, right? Uh, and I think that logically that makes sense because I think the way you understand the world, the way you kind of branch out to explore the world as, a, as one of these users is you start with your house, you start with your office, you start with school, and you kind of look at the places you know, and you develop an interpretive skill, and then you look at other places and use those interpretive skills. And so if you can't start with your house, it's just a blur in your neighborhood, you, you, you just, I mean, it's all about you, basically. So you've got to start at your house, and there's, you know, six billion people with six billion houses, and it's pretty inconvenient to have all the data, and it costs a lot. So I think there's a real place for that. Okay, is there another one over there? I think there was one more over there. Yep. You. Yes, you. Be brave. Stand up. Um, I was wondering if you had any insight as to what exactly changed like, in the mindset of scientists from the 1600s to now for the increasing opacity of data. Because obviously there must have been some kind of change if they changed so much now. Um, it's like the increasing complexity or what do you think OK, so the question was, what changed if the scientists were all open-minded sharing people in the past and they're data hoarders now. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, you know, the, the, the truth is a lot of things changed. And the people that do the behavior I didn't like, they're totally rational people optimizing their circumstances. I'm not making fun of them. It's like free enterprise. They've, they've conformed to the, the, the best way to play the game. I just don't like the game. The people are great. They just want to change the game a little bit. Um, science in the 1600s was the way yachting and horse owning is, racehorse owning is now. Rich people and their children with spare time tried to solve fourth degree equations. They looked at microscopes and cut their finger and looked at the blood droplets. Okay? It, was, it, wasn't, it was like buying a yacht. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't something you did as a job. Something you did as a kind of a, a, a unjustifiable passion. Okay? And so those people, all they had, th their, their reward was sharing their passion with other people that were like, like, had like, like a passion. So, like you might say, well, you know, those basketball players get paid millions a year to play basketball. Look at all the fools out there playing in the court of the, down at the park. They're not getting paid at all. Well, that's not true. The ones at the park are actually doing it for fun, right? And so these original scientists were in large measure just incurably curious people who were probably shunned by their spouses and friends for spending all day, you know, looking at a microscope, or cutting their finger, whatever, you know, goofy things like that. And so they were looking for somebody that didn't laugh at them, and they were down at the bar with Newton, okay? Now, that, that, that was a kind of a citizen scientist, right? An amateur scientist, like I'm an amateur mathematician. I solve hard problems, but nobody pays me. It's just fun, okay? Now, if you're in that situation, you want to publish, you want to tell people about it, you want to share it. You've got nothing to keep. If you keep it, you've lost. You want to share it, okay? Now we have professional scientists, and I probably... You, for example, okay? <laughs> Somebody pays you to do that. Now, it might be that you like it so much you do it for free, but you don't ever let that on to your boss, right? <laughs> if you have you know, estates and yachts and things, you don't let that on either. You keep it to yourself, and they pay you to do the work. When that, whether it's the university pays you or the you know, government, the MacArthur Foundation, whatever it is, you, you, the, there's money for your work. When, when that, that's not a bad thing, because now there are millions of scientists, used to be like dozens of scientists, okay? Frederick the Great, Frederick the, Frederick the Second, King of Germany, uh, France, or, you know, Burgundy, uh, Italy, Sicily, Jerusalem, because of the Crusades. He, he, he issued a decree that nobody could do surgery unless they'd read this book from this, this, this uh, Arabic book. They've been translating into English in Cremona. If you were doing this book, you couldn't do a surgery. That was the first professional certification. It was like, they were like, they were like they were, not that they were playing before, but it was like an amateur thing before. Then there was like a professionalism to it. And there was like a university. There was this whole thing built up. 
Now, you, you really, you have to publish or you, you know, get in trouble. You have to get money from the government somehow or you get in trouble or corporations, right? If it's corporations, they, they, they kind of want some, what you're doing, they want it to be them. They want to know where the oil is, they want, it, they want the oil, right? Okay, if it's the government, you've got to give the data up. You don't have to give up the interpretation of the data. You can kind of play games with how to make use of the data. And so if you, if you, if you do that, then next year you can say, I've got this valuable asset. I want to mine that asset for the next important, you know, seamount or something and see where the little squids are. But I, I, you know, only I can work with my data. And you see PIs doing that. I look at a lot of those things. You know, and, uh, you know it's, 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 it's a natural response. And all I'm saying is there are other ways to do it. And if somebody gives you an extra pot of money, but it comes with the strings that money you didn't expect, but you've got to share more, you can't build your data empire on this particular new money, then you haven't lost anything. You had the money you had to start with, which wasn't very much, but you had that. And you got some more, but it comes with a more openness uh, policy associated with it. Okay? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.